neurologist, and as a neurologist, I have the privilege and often difficult task of diagnosing patients with severe neurological disorders. Um, my specialty is dementia. And this is a difficult disease to deal with in both the patients and the families that have to witness this disease. Dementia causes a progressive loss of our ability to lay down new memories, to communicate with our friends and families, to perceive, to work the projector, <laughs> <laughs> to perceive what's real and not real. And eventually this disease takes over the brain and can eat away at the core of what really makes us a person. So these diseases really need to be addressed. There's a very concerning, alarming rate of Alzheimer's disease in this country, and we need to develop treatments for that disease. Now, I became interested in dementia when I was a resident at the University of Pennsylvania doing my neurology training. And there, when I got interested in dementia, you might think that I would go into Alzheimer's disease research. But in fact, I was drawn down a different, less common pathway. And this was because of my experience there. I witnessed several patients who had a very unusual form of dementia. This is a very rare condition that occurs in only about 300 cases per year in the United States. And this disease had very interesting roots. Sheep developed this disease. Cannibals developed this disease. And cows developed this disease. So you can see why I was intrigued. These diseases are interesting diseases. They're neurodegenerative diseases that are actually transmissible. So even if there's a genetic form of the disease that actually does occur, you can take nervous tissue from that patient or any one of these and transmit it to a healthy individual, a healthy sheep or cow or a cannibal, and transmit the disease. So these are neurodegenerative transmissible diseases. These are collectively called prion diseases. And these prion diseases have, at the core of these diseases, the cause is a misfolded protein. So what does that mean? So all proteins, we make tens of thousands of proteins in our brain, throughout our body. They carry out a, a variety of functions, including structure, and all of our biological activities that keep our brains healthy and active. Now, all proteins, when they're synthesized, they fall into their native conformation, or a three-dimensional shape that allows them to do their job. In the case of prion disease, what happens is this protein becomes misfolded or misshapen. So the protein doesn't go into its normal three-dimensional conformation. This misshapen protein turns out to be pathogenic. We call this a prion. And this prion now has the ability to do some strange things. And this explains why it's transmissible. Here's how it works. The misfolded protein interacts with normal protein in the brain. So in prion, with the prion protein, it's concentrated throughout our brain and our neurons. The bad misfolded protein will interact with the good protein that's on those cells and interact by simple protein-protein interaction and transfer its conformation onto the normal protein. This causes an accumulation of misfolded protein. And now these new misfolded proteins can carry out the work and spread to other normal proteins and continue the misfolding. So you can imagine that on a protein-to-protein -protein level, that this is interacting within the cell, converting proteins within that cell, and then transferred to the adjacent cell, converting more proteins, and then the adjacent brain region, until it really encompasses the entire brain and causes severe uh, neurological disease. Now, if we look in the brains of these patients, what we see are these deposits of protein, which are the accumulation of these misfolded proteins. These clumps are also called amyloid. Amyloid is at the heart of this disease, but amyloid is also at the heart of another disease, Alzheimer's disease. 
So these very unusual diseases that are very rare and occur in about 300 cases per year, as I said, are, well, I guess we want a little fast forward, but that's okay, uh, <laughs> uh, which were very unusual and transmissible diseases also seem to have some similarities with Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that over the years, as people have looked, even though we in the pre end field have been trying to convince people that all neurodegenerative diseases probably relate to a misfolded protein disorder that can propagate that misfolded protein. We finally recognize this, and within the last several years, we see that a variety of neurodegenerative diseases have at the core of the etiology of these diseases is a misfolded protein. Now this is the prion protein, but here is a different protein called beta amyloid. Each disease has its own protein, but they all misfold and propagate their conformation. So when we see a Parkinson's patient, we see a tremor that starts in one hand and then it starts to spread and goes into the other and, and spreads throughout the body. This is kind of the spreading of the prion. So this is a common theme now throughout biology. So what do we do in our lab? My lab work is really guided by the patients that I see. And I wanted to show you an example of a patient with prion disease. One of the features of prion disease is uh, ataxia, or extreme incoordination. In this case, this patient has ataxia of the left arm. This is unusual because typically the disease will occur bilaterally. Patients will present with both arms and both legs, having difficulty with coordination. But he started out unilaterally. So the left arm was affected, the right brain was affected by this disease. But when we see these diseases in the very early stages, we may see this focus of disease that then spreads throughout the brain, because that's the prions propagating throughout the brain. So we see this patient, and you can see at this point, he has difficulty even carrying out the motor movement that he's willing. There's no connection between the will and the activity, the movement activity that he wants to create. So we modeled this disease, and in this case, we made a transgenic mouse that carries a gene that's mutated and is associated with a familial form of prion disease called gerstmann strauss or Schenker disease. And you can see how unsteady this mice, mouse is. They're usually very agile creatures, and this guy is really having lots of trouble walking. So this goes over the course of about 30 days, the mouse develops the severe ataxia and then eventually dies from this disease. And when we look at the brain, we see these plaques or clumps of amyloid. So these are stained now. This is a lower power magnification. Uh, and we stain these uh, clumps with a green stain. So this animal is a really good model for prion disease, uh, in genetic form of prion disease in particular. And this mouse has been so useful that it's now flown the coop, although we still keep it, but it's made its way to other labs throughout the country and across the seas in the UK. So people are using these mice to be able to develop their own therapies against prion disease. So we look, this is a sort of a macro scale of a model, and now we look at a micro scale, and within cells, we can do some live imaging. Of, so these are cells that are alive, and just took away my joke. Um, <laughs> these are cells that, that are alive, uh, and what you see is a time lapse of, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> see, help me out with this. Uh, and what you see is a, a increase in the aggregation of these proteins. So those clumps are forming. So we Actually, this takes eight hours to make that video that took three seconds to show you. So it's a time-lapse image of live cells under a microscope. So we can watch this protein accumulate, and we can follow it in the cell. What is the cell doing with this protein? How is it trying to get rid of that protein and degrade it? So we want to harness what the cell does as part of our therapy to get rid of this protein. So our next step is at another level of modeling is to look at a molecular level. So we want to look at the proteins, how the misfolded protein interacts with the folded, normally folded protein. 
and how this propagation occurs. So of course we turn to yeast, and yeast really turn out to be an excellent biofactory in which we can express these abnormal, normal and abnormal proteins. And you can see this is very diffuse. This is a normally folded protein compared to the misfolded protein that forms these aggregates. So we apply a technique called FRET, where we can look at specific interactions of the proteins in these yeast cells, and we can look at how uh, we can maybe block that interaction. So here's what we have learned. Our approach is a three-pronged approach. We block misfolded protein, we degrade it, and we try to prevent it from ever forming. So we used our Homer Simpson yeast model, and we found that making specific changes in the protein at various regions, we found a specific region that was critical to this conformational change, so that when we had these proteins interact, the conformation could not be passed from the misfolded protein to the normally folded protein. So this never happens. So we can inhibit maybe the propagation of these proteins from one cell to another, from one person to another, but specifically cell to cell. So we can maybe treat this. So we wanted to test, this is an in vitro uh, assay that we use, and we wanted to make sure that this is gonna work in a macroscopic scale, so we made another mouse. And this mouse carries this protein that it should be resistant to prions. It shouldn't be able to be converted to the misfolded form. So we're waiting. We've inoculated this mouse with some prions and it's still incubating and so far so good. So if we can show that this mouse doesn't get sick and not susceptible to prion disease, then that would be an excellent target that we can define and uh, develop small molecules that might fit in that region or antibodies that will block the interaction. Next, we degrade the protein. So we use that live cell imaging technique, looked at where, how this protein was being handled in the cell to try to degrade it. We found a process called autophagy that eats aggregated protein in this case, and we enhanced that process in our mice. The mice were treated with drug and compared. These are, whoops, these are our brain slices again, showing the green clumps, and after a, a small and a higher, a low and high dose of drug, we found a reduction and then elimination of those clumps. And this increased the survival of our mice by 20%, and this translates to about seven years in humans that develop this genetic disease that those mice display. And then finally, we try to prevent this. And this is the newest um, work that we're uh, embarking on now. And we've actually made a fair amount of progress, which is to target the specific gene that produces the misfolded protein. And this is for genetic prion diseases that we know the mutated gene is causing the misfolding of this protein. So we can target that specific mutated gene and turn it off so it never makes the bad protein. And this is really important for people who have genetic prion disease. And particularly important for one case that I'm following, whose mother died from a genetic prion disease, and she knows that she carries the gene. And she has about 10 years before she may develop this disease. So these are really critical studies that she and others are interested in. So, once treatments for these misfolded protein-related diseases are developed, we have one more thing ahead of us that we have to figure out. We want to identify patients who are going to develop a disease at the, or have started to show symptoms of the disease at the earliest stage. Because we found already that if we wait too long, patients are not going to get better with some of the therapies that are developed. So we want to identify patients at the very earliest stage. So we looked at Alzheimer's disease patients, uh, and we uh, sat down with our imaging friends uh, in my uh, group, and we decided to, to apply um, uh, a new imaging technique to predict Alzheimer's disease in patients. So we asked, where would we look first? 
And we know that memory problems are the initial problems in Alzheimer's disease patients. And the place to look is in the hippocampus, which is the region, and the temporal lobes here, which sit right behind your eyes and your brain. And the hippocampus, all of our information comes into the hippocampus, and that allows us to consolidate and make memories so we can later retrieve them. So we looked in that area, and we used anatomical studies looking at MRI. And you can see, this is a face-on view now, so if you cut my face off and look straight ahead, this is the hippocampus, and you can see in the normal individual compared to the Alzheimer individual, there's a lot more atrophy in the Alzheimer case than the normal control, right? The black part is space, so that means the brain has shrunken. Okay. Now, this is a group of patients that we predict is at higher risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. Mild cognitive impairment essentially means that you have a little bit more memory problems than what's considered normal for aging, but it's not really significant enough to interfere with your daily routine, and it's not a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But in this group of patients, there are a certain percentage of patients that will convert to Alzheimer's. They'll develop Alzheimer's disease within a year, two years, three years, or five years. And some will never convert to Alzheimer's disease. So even if we call these high-risk patients, they don't we can, still can't predict who's going to develop disease and who isn't. So we want to say, in that group, who's going to develop Alzheimer's disease? Those are the ones we want to treat with the therapies that are developed. If we look anatomically, we don't see much change or difference in the atrophy compared to the normal. And so that doesn't help us. But we use the special imaging technique called diffusion tensor imaging. And this allows us to look at the connections in the brain. So we looked specifically at, a connection, at the connections that lead into the hippocampus. So an area of fiber bundles of neurons that lead into the hippocampus and allow the hippocampus to um, experience the memories and the information that need to be consolidated into memories. And when we use this technique and analyze the data, we found that there's clearly a difference between normals and Alzheimer patients. Alzheimer's was uh, much smaller in the pathway. It's hard to see, but that little yellow arrow is where it is. But the MCI patients, they fell into two camps. They either fell into a camp that, in which they look like the normal individuals, the scans of the normals, or they fell into a camp where they look like Alzheimer disease patients. So we follow these patients clinically over the course of another year. And we were blinded and simply made a clinical diagnosis and what happened to them using lots of neuropsychological evaluations? <clears throat> we found that the MCI patients that fell, based on this scan, fell into the normal category, didn't change over the course of a year clinically, whereas those that fell into the Alzheimer's disease category converted to Alzheimer's disease. So clearly, we were able to predict who in that group was going to develop Alzheimer's disease. So this is a work in progress. This is a pilot study. But so far, we've been uh, having 100% success in predicting who is going to develop Alzheimer's disease. We feel pretty confident about this uh, for future studies. So I'll just leave you with two words of wisdom in the end, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> There's um, senile dementia, and there's Alzheimer's, and there's all kinds of wastebasket terms for what happens when you get old and start forgetting things and pee in your drawers and all that. So um, what's the difference between, like, for example, Alzheimer's and uh, senile dementia? Okay. So um, I think the, the, the biggest... Mis not misconception, but difficulty in families to understand these words and terminology is the fact of dementia versus Alzheimer's disease, and that may be what you're getting at. Dementia is really a big category. It's like cancer. So you have cancer, and then you have multiple kinds of cancer, bone cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer. In this case, you have dementia. Alzheimer's disease is a single type of dementia. It's the most common of all the dementias. But there are other dementias 
frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, dementia due to normal pressure hydrocephalus. So there's a list of other conditions that can cause dementia. Dementia is simply, in broad terms, it's cognitive decline that's significant enough to interfere with your work or play. And that's really almost how the clinical criteria is established now. That's how the diagnosis is made. Now, we have a lot of specifics on how we define the cognitive decline and where that is and how significant it is. But really, when the cognitive decline affects your daily living, that constitutes the definition of dementia. I have a question, please. Okay. I, I had, uh, I'm not exactly sure how this fits into your presentation, but I read, uh, and, and I'll apologize for being the least scientific person in this auditorium. Right. I read an article in, I want to say, the Wall Street Journal within the last several months that uh, discussed uh, linkage between exercise and uh, prevention or uh, limiting the likely occurrence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And I'm wondering how, if you're familiar with studies like that and how that might interact with the work that you're doing. Okay, so yes, I'm very familiar with that. Um, in fact, at the University of Chicago is where some of the initial experiments were done to show that uh, exercise was beneficial in delaying the development of Alzheimer's disease. So mice, if you put them in a cage and you don't give them any exercise wheel or anything to do, they develop the Alzheimer's disease sooner. And these are mice that are engineered to develop Alzheimer's disease than those that have the wheel and they get their exercise and they run. So clearly the exercise is important. There's a lot of research going on right now to try to determine what's the proper amount of exercise. Most people kind of hand wave around 30 minutes and it should be aerobic exercise. And it's not only just what we kind of naturally think that the heart's pumping well and getting blood to the brain and oxygenating our brain cells uh, good, but there's actually genes that are turned on with exercise that are sort of growth and neuroprotectants, growth factors and neuroprotectants. So uh, exercise is really an important uh, aspect of therapy, and I recommend it to all my patients that come to me with memory problems. Well, then how does that interact with the misfolded preamble? That's an excellent question. <laughs> That's going to take a lot of time to figure out. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid we should move on. Yeah. Thank you, Jim.